Hallelujah. Praise God. We're going to go to Isaiah 53 and verse 6 and then Numbers uh, chapter 27 and verse 17. There's an old saying that denotes kind of a the characteristic that could be taken in a negative note, but when I heard it in the, in the text that we're used tonight, I thought it was quite interesting. Sheepish. <laughs> well, I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings here, and I definitely, but, you know, when you talk about rising to the top, and you talk about your life, you know, I want to be a sheep. You don't say that. I want to be a lion. If you throw me to the wolves, I'll come back leader of the pack. For five minutes. But over the longevity of our lives, God knew what he was talking about when he compared us to sheep. It's not glorious. No one's going to put a picture of a sheep on a t-shirt that's going to be very intimidating. This doesn't have that connotation because that's not what the Lord was looking for. Amen? Amen. If you're in Isaiah 53 and 6, it says, all we, everybody say like, like, sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. I, I love the parallel, the fact that Jesus became the lamb slain from the foundation. So almighty God coming as a lamb. Really? They were hoping for a mighty warrior. So Isaiah utilizes a picture here of sheep going astray to describe the spiritual condition of people, of each of us. In Numbers chapter 27, verse 17, actually, I'm just going to read 15 through 17 for context. And Moses spake unto the Lord, saying, Let the Lord, the God of the spirits of all flesh, set a man over the congregation which may go out before them, which may go in before them, which may lead them out and which may bring them in. Here you got the picture of a shepherd. That the congregation of the Lord be not as sheep which have no shepherd. If you're the person that comes and goes on your own, you're without a shepherd. Jesus is letting us know, the Lord is letting us know, and it's, it's a thread throughout Scripture that whether we like it or not, no matter what stage you are in life, you need a shepherd. The Bible says you need a pastor. In, in fact, I believe it's in the Latin that the word shepherd literally is pastor. So Moses warned the children of the Lord that they not act as sheep without a shepherd. How many of us, you know what a, a sheep without a shepherd is? A joke. It's another word. The goat. All right. Lord, we thank you for your word today. Lord, we want to enjoy the presence of the Lord. We want to grow and we want to learn. Help us to get some character things taken care of. Help us to be groomed and be taught, be shown and that way we are changed tonight and we become more like you, that we become the sheep of your pasture. In Jesus' name, and everybody said amen. 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 You can be seated. Jesus saw, and he makes a statement, as he looked out over the multitude when he went from village to village during his time of preaching and teaching, he his reaction when he saw the people is described in Matthew 9 and 36. He said, and when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered as sheep, having no shepherd. And I'll be the first one to tell you, there's just sometimes I'm not in the mindset or mood to be told what to do. I've never looked back on those days with, excitement of, well, that was a good decision. Most of the time it's been with regret. I know that the Bible also tells us, it tells us uh, that, that uh, 
There is safety in a multitude of wise counsel, Vince. It's good to get good advice. Be careful, the, the Bible, the, the, no, the notion there is wise counsel, experienced. And the last thing you want to do, okay, should I move out of my parents' house? Don't go to another teenager and ask that. Why don't you go ask some adults? Should I buy this car? Don't ask your teenager. No, get the Mustang Cobra so you can be indebted for the next seven years of your life and never recover. Don't ask an adult. Ask someone that's got some wise... I mean, I could go on and on. I don't want to spend a lot of time on that point. So why does the Bible, and why does Jesus himself often use sheep as an example of people? You have to understand that back in that time, sheep were, even in the Roman Empire, currency. Valuable. Relevant to their times. Also something that the listeners could easily identify with. Okay, we know how the operation of a, of a shepherd and sheep is. But I believe the main reason is because there are so many similarities between sheep and people. What causes sheep to stray? As pictured in our text in Isaiah. What causes sheep to wander? Why are they so prone to wander? Why are people prone to wander? What causes? Look inward here. What causes you to stray and wake up? Why did I spend so much time on this? Why? Did I pour so much effort with so little return? You know, the Bible is very clear that, you know, the things of God are eternal. The things of the world are temporal. But yet, how, how many of us wake up? Do I really spend a lot of time involved in that in my life? Why are people so prone to be unsettled, restless? I heard one, one uh pastor's wife teaching one time and she says we live in a time of people with restless spirits you've always got to be involved in something going somewhere that's why facebook is so popular because you can actually feel like you're a part of something bigger when you know nobody really cares what you, what you have I don't, I, I don't care how great that romaine lettuce looked on there and your 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 hamburger with your french fries. you know i get it it makes me think of a moment i'd like to have a burrito or a hamburger or whatever but I'll tell you what, you want to really eliminate the memory on your phone? Go through and eliminate all of them pictures of food that when you look at a year from now, like, oh, okay. How many pictures on the walls do you have of a good meal you had? You don't. You put pictures of family because people really matter. Or you hear what I'm saying? Anybody post pictures of other things? Well, you'll wake up one day and go, man, I wasted a lot of time with something that didn't matter. I wanted to say this. I said, I wrote this. I said, who, who in the Bible could really show us a picture of someone that really woke up one day? The prodigal. He was so confident and so sure he knew the way. He was so confident and hell-bent to do exactly what he wanted, regardless of a very successful father standing right there, an older brother right there, that survived that same time without doing that same thing. Anybody here honest enough to realize, I grew up in some areas a little later than others. <laughs> Hello? But it's interesting in Luke 15 and 17 what he says. And, and here I've been talking about the inner monologue. I don't, I don't know if he blurted this out loud. If it was me, I probably would have blurted it out loud to myself. And when he came to himself, he said, how many hired servants of my fathers have bread enough and despair, and I perish with hunger. I can imagine myself sitting there. And you have to understand, anybody here ever fed pigs? Oh, Lord. I remember my dad, when he worked out at the Air Force Base, he would bring these great big 250-gallon barrels of all the cafeteria stuff. And I would help and dump these 50 gallon. Oh, my God. And if it, no, you already got the smell of the pigs. You've already got the flies in the air. And now you pull up with 250 gallon. You got a million pounds of slop. And you can't pour 50 gallons of slop without it splashing. It, it doesn't want to go on the ground. It wants to land on you. It's got a purpose. Let me land on Steve. And so as we're pouring this stuff on,
I imagine this guy with that odor and that scent waking up, you know, my hands on myself. What am I doing? I got hell bent and I wandered away from the safety of a sheep phone. I didn't want a shepherd telling me yes and no. I didn't want the wisdom and the experience to mess up with my impetuousness. And we simply lose our minds. We want control until it gets out of control. And like that old country song, we get in a mess. Jesus, take the wheel. Oh, yeah, great. God's like, yeah, okay, you're spinning 50 miles an hour on a sheet of black ice, and now you give it to me. I mean, anybody ever been through that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't know how many times I've had someone, nobody comes up to me and goes, you know, Pastor, I am so thankful. I just want to bless the Lord with about $20,000, and I'm so thankful, and they do everything right. Nobody comes to me like that. They come to me, I, I need help with my bills. I need help with this. I need help. I need a new car. I need that. Nobody comes with everything going well. We all are like sheep. <laughs> How many seen that video of that sheep that that guy rescued out of that ditch that's been circulating on Facebook? And he hops out. He's so happy. He runs. He woohoo! <laughs> right back in there. I was going to play that tonight, but that man never already seen it. If you haven't seen it, go find it. If you haven't seen it, you don't know they're friends. <laughs> and it runs right back into the same ditch. Isn't that us? You just wait for, I'm going to do something great for God. Next thing you know, you wake up and you're involved in the same hobby or habit or whatever that's kept you from doing what you really wanted to do. Are you hearing me? There's an old country boy once that talked about how often his family moved. And he said, you know, every time a truck backed up to our house, a chicken sat down and crossed their legs. Watch it. What causes adults, young people, elderly, to wander through life aimlessly. Let's be honest. You get up, man, I got all the time in the world. I can do what I want. Yet, we read in the Bible time after time of people who didn't realize their time was up. The, the rich, I'm going to build big, I'm going to, I'm, I'm, In the world's mentality, he was the picture of success. But from heaven, it's like, oh, you poor sheep. You don't have a pastor. You don't have a pastor. You don't have someone that can look at you and go, you've lost your way. What will cause us to stray if we're not careful? What will cause our poor choices now? Cause us to abandon major obligation. Can I tell you what it is? You don't have a shepherd. You've drifted away from the shepherd. Well, I come to church all the time. Yeah, but can pastor look at you and say, you know, <laughs> you're spending a lot of time on it. Your life is filled with that. You know, you ever thought about you know, Paradigm shift. Because you know, when Jesus comes, there's going to be no pig slop, pig pen, and pigs to help you come to yourself. It's over. The sheep, more than any other animal, scripture is mentioned and alluded to. It's so ingrained in the mindset and the culture of the Bible that they instantly understood and comprehended the meaning associated with the comparison throughout the Old and the New Testament. It's all throughout. It's thread throughout. Jesus is uh, understandable to us as the lion of the tribe of Judah. Can we say that in his day? They, they, oh, yeah. But he was also the Lamb of God that take away the sin of the world. The problem is we aren't as familiar with the idea of sheep and shepherds, so we struggle to be sheepish like we should be. And so for in our text today, it resonates at such a deep level that Psalm 23 is used at just about every funeral. I am convinced that although it resonates deep within us, if we don't really understand it, then we can't truly apply it. 
And even if you're a seasoned saint, it's easy to read through it and not allow it to work through you. We find ourselves in some woolly situations. We simply aren't sheepish enough. Because we refuse, we refuse the need of a shepherd, we feel, oh, that's beneath me. Psalms 23 is a psalm that we tend to think about as about us, right? But it is as much about us as it is about the shepherd. The psalm gives us some of the most clear and thorough glimpses of who we are following when we come into the body of Christ, the, the fold and flock of God. I think in order for us to be as sheepish as we can, we, we have to have a clear revelation of our shepherd and the role he plays in our lives. So I'm going to read this. I want you to pay attention, pay special attention to what we get out of it about our shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. I'm thankful that as a child, I learned that, you know what? My parents are always going to give me what I needed over what I, but sadly we get older, we become our own shepherd. I get what I want and I'm anemic on what I need. You've heard me say before, the problem with young people today is they buy what they want and beg for what they need. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. It's gonna come up in a minute. He leads me beside still or quiet waters. Is that really how your life looks? You're from turmoil to turmoil. You're from mental anguish to, uh, hello? He restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. I thought it was about my name's sake, making me look good. My reputation. Oh. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. His rod and staff and comfort you in a long time. They flat just make you mad. Y'all don't want to hear this today, do you? It's all good when you're when, when you're you go home and your kids need to hear this or they need to hear that. Or that joker driving down the road needs a piece of your mind. But you come in the house, God, I don't need that's not for me. You're not sheepish enough. You're not sheepish enough. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Man, if God really did that to you, it would go out of your, in fact, you do go out of your mind. Because you think you should have no enemy. Then how would you know you ever really loved like Jesus did? I'm not going to spend a lot of time here. These are tidbits that I'm giving you to write down because I want you to look introspectively. See, some people are so, un you know who sheep fight with? Each other. They can't beat nobody else up. <laughs> Hello? Listen. You prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies. You have anointed my head with oil, my up overflows. Surely goodness and loving kindness will follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And although we're going to focus on the shepherd, let me mention that Christians are like sheep in that you have to be led. We have to be led. We, you've got to have a prayer life. You've got to have that place in you're humble enough to know, you know what, I need a pasture and a pastor. Mm -hmm. I need a leader because as a sheep, him that's going to lead me to give rest, to lead with care, to guide to the right places of refreshing the watering place or station, to cause me to rest, what you can't sleep, what's, oh, someone's not sheepish enough. Mm -hmm. To guide me. Sheep are helpless in the face of predators. Did you know that? 
I, I didn't know I was going to preach this, but the last couple of weeks, I just kind of got fascinated with this thing that goes on more in New Zealand and Australia and England. You know what the, one of the main predators are to sheep in those countries? Huh? It's because you've been watching me. Birds. Fowls of the air. When the, when the lambing, they call it lambing season, when the lambs are dropped, sad to say it, but the ravens and the crows, they find a newborn lamb even before it's fully birthed and they come down and start pecking the tongue and the eyes out of the baby lamb the first thing the predators want to do is take your ability to see and speak there are predators from the very moment you walk into church, the first thing they want to do is blind you and steal your voice. Are you hearing what I'm saying? I'm not going into that. Let me keep on. I don't want to be, I don't want to make this a two weeker. <laughs> sheep have trouble getting along with other sheep. Some of us got that in spades. Sheep are totally dependent for their well being upon the shepherd. Sheep are stubborn and have a tendency to wander away from the shepherd. When you recognize these tendencies about ourselves, when you recognize that, you know, can anybody be honest and say, you know what, Pastor, you've kind of pointed me out a little bit. Can anybody be honest and say, you know, even in my years serving God, I, I, as I'm doing this study, I'm putting this together, I'm like going, I see a lot of me here. I, I want to be sheepish, but I find I'm kind of more goatish. But when you're honest with yourself, you re realize and understand how important and how valuable not only of what a shepherd does, but having a shepherd. From the beginning, we need to realize that when we read this psalm, all reluctance to be sheepish should be removed. I need to be teachable, leadable, guidable, humble. Are you hearing me? Because it's in our human arrogance is even say, I don't need a shepherd. Well, this is the wrong class for you. The goat class is somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And the sheep that needs a shepherd. It's easy to determine that we have a good and gracious and sufficient shepherd. Because loving Jesus is easy. Since we are like sheep, let's discover what our shepherd actually does for us. He guides, he provides, he restores, he protects, he corrects, and he connects. So why are we, and, and I, I would have wrote this down 10 times to say it, 10 times over. Why are we so reluctant to be sheepish when we have a shepherd that does all that? When you stop to realize, anybody ever had God do something for you? I'm amazed and I, I, I don't, I don't, I, I couldn't stop talking about all the things that God has done for me, but yet he's done so much for me. He's, I mean, it, it blows my mind, but yet why do I still have that reluctance? I'll say it about me because it's easier for you to handle it by point at me, but you can apply it to you if you're honest. Why am I? reluctant or apprehensive when I know all that about God? Why, why am I so quick to wander my own way when I know God is so good for me? Why is it that I know his word is blessed and it's precious? Am I more prone to heed my own advice or somebody else's when it comes to the things? Why am I, why am I like that? Both your ears, children, I'm going to be honest. And I'm speaking of me. Because I'm stupid. I am. I'm stupid. I am like a sheep. And the Bible's very clear about sheep being kind of dumb. Sheep are not the smartest animals in the kingdom. They're just, they're not, that's not their 
think they're just, they're not strong and defensive and, and strategic. Uh, <sighs> we have the opportunity, though, in that situation to have a shepherd, a great shepherd that brings all the attributes that I don't have for my protection. I, I've heard it said that God will never take you where the grace of God can't keep you. But I believe the psalmist would rather say it like this. The shepherd won't guide you to a place where he will provide what you need. He guides us under provision two ways. Green pastures. Now, it's pretty apparent that when we read over this portion of Scripture, we normally read over it quickly. Ah, green pastures, great. When we read that picture, especially of <laughs> the land or property in Israel or Jerusalem, mm -hmm. kind of looks more like the hills of uh, um, Phoenix. Not a lot of green out there. <laughs> not, not as, it's, it's not like the rolling hills of Ireland. So it's essential to remember that it is being written to people that understand that, okay? Because Israel or is a bunch of rocks. It's barren. It's dry. There's very little rain between May and October, and parched is an understatement. But when the psalmist declares that our shepherd makes us to lie down in three pastures, we fail to recognize the work that is involved to get us there. Are you tired of being in the dry places? Are you tired of always navigating rocks? Maybe it's time you understand he wants to lead and guide you to green pastures, but green pastures don't just happen. They're created. They're created. As we were coming in for a landing, it blew my mind as I was watching the Arizona landscape how many spots out in the middle of brown nowhere, there's this square of green. Look, they don't have clouds that come in on a GPA system and go, I'm going to rain right here in this square. Someone created that environment. Someone took the time to make sure that spot was watered and green. That means the shepherd rolled up his sleeves and went to work when you were looking to provide, to take care, to make a place of nourishment for you. But the only way to get there was let the shepherd that prepared it get you there. You got to be teachable, guidable, instructable. Because someone had to clear the rocks and someone had to irrigate it in order for there to be green pastures. This is what the psalmist is saying about our shepherd. He's working behind the scenes for our good. He's doing things you can't see. And I'll, I'll venture to say a lot of what we go through are merely because we haven't been led and we've wandered. I'll never forget a message Pastor Price taught one of the new convert storms that could have been avoided. Mm -hmm. You see, he's working a plan even when we're not aware of it. Preached a passage years ago, God has a plan. He's always got a plan. He's not flying by the seat of his pants. He's got a plan. He's got, he's got everything orchestrated. He worked to get the sheepfold or the church ready for you to walk in and be a part. He worked to get you to hear the right song, the right sermon, and make the right friend and hear the right word and the right teaching and the food to be nourished. He's preparing a pasture for you. If we're not careful, we have a tendency to overlook the handiwork of our children. I thank God so many times I look back my pastor, my shepherd that preached and taught, and here I am, I'm just showing up. But God orchestrated so just what I needed, even, and I've told the story that I walked into the church one time, and I got so irritated and so aggravated that I thought, man, this is going to be my last service, and the service was just for me.
God's been toiling for our good. He's been working for our good. He works for us. He tends his flocks and he takes care of us. And sometimes we need to realize that the pain we're suffering from is self-inflicted because we've got out from under the protection of our shepherd. Still waters. Why still waters? Can I tell you something? Sheep are afraid of rushing waters. They won't approach crazy wild waters. They want still waters. He, he's telling us that our shepherd is conscious of our fears, our worry. Be anxious for the too many people are running around. The church should not be running around free. God. I can't handle it. I can't do it. It's too much. For what? Yeah. I can tell you what's happened to you. You've drifted. You've wandered. You're too far away. For, you want to get mad and get upset and curse. Oh, something, something's mad. Oh, you're. The reason we face so many troubled waters is we refuse to be led. Sadly, we tend to be drawn towards chaos. Like that sheep. Guy reaches down and pulls it out of the ditch, and it's like, yeah, I'm going to go my other way. Boing! Right back into the ditch. Right back to the road. In fact, the Bible uses the term like a dog returning to its vomit. We've all seen a dog do that. How many of us says, you know what? I'm not doing that again. I'm going to live for God. I'm going to get in church. The next thing you know, you're completely surrounded by whatever it is that's engulfed your mind, engulfed your heart. And you're like, man, I, uh, when's my turn to sing or preach? Or when's my turn to be used to God? Get, allow the shepherd to come drag you out of that ditch. Be honest with you. Tell you the truth. Sit you down. Then stay close. Shepherd wants to lead us beside still waters. He restores. Several authors who were formerly shepherds have written about the fact that sheep have a tendency to lie down after they eat. Well, I'm a whole lot of likes that when it comes to being sheep. It's, I love nothing better than eat a whole bunch of food and sit down and sleep. Right? Amen. Ain't nothing better than gorging on Thanksgiving dinner and sleeping for the next six hours and getting up and doing it all over again. <laughs> right? That's how their food died. That's how cattle's foods digest. But the issue is, is sometimes if sheep are not careful, even on a side hill or something like that, when they, when they shift or turn, the weight of not only itself, but its wool can literally capsize it and its legs are like up in, and it can't do nothing because the weight of what it's carrying, it's stuck. It can't ride itself. Lost its balance. Can't feel to touch the ground and it's kind of upside down doing the whole turtle move. Or the sun, or the elements, or the predators find it in this weak and upturned condition because it's wandered away from the shepherd. And it's vulnerable. And those sheep can die just within a few hours, if not momentarily, depending on the predators. A sheep. A good shepherd keeps his attention on the sheep and watch and watches for those vulnerable sheep and steps in and turns them back over and restores their equilibrium. But sadly, I, as a pastor, I'm around, there's just some people you, you can't get close to. There's just those people that refuse. They got somebody else as their leader or somebody else that they following a real shepherd that loves and would care for them can't get close. I'm thankful for a shepherd that restores our soul. I'm thankful that he even recognizes those that are downcast. Oh. He is the restorer of my soul and the lifter of my head. He has picked me up so many times when I've been down, but that's because I stayed close enough to allow him to. Sometimes anybody ever made a mess so bad that you're like, I made such a mess out of this. I can't even. Someone came up and told me what I needed to do. I 
be upset about it. Hello? I like the fact that God can bring balance back into our lives if we'll listen to the shepherd. Amen. Mm -hmm. Psalms 3 says this, verse 3, 3, but thou, O Lord, art a shield. I want you to listen to this. It's beautiful. A protection for me, my glory, and the lifter up of mine head. What does that mean? He lifts me up when I fall. I'll say this again later, but sheep, the sheep closest to the shepherd are the safest. Amen. Amen. I'm so thankful that I was close to my pastor. I'm so thankful that, you know, some of you, I could even, I could even show up at his house and take people he's never met. These are people in my church, and they'll greet them like they're his. There's something about being close. There's something about when you've been close to the shepherd, when you've been close to God, it's easy to be close to the shepherd because you have an understanding. There's sometimes he's going to be loving and helpful and giving, and then sometimes he's going to reach in with a little nut. Oh, no, 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 I need you to go this way. No, 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 no. I, I know it don't make sense to you. You want to go that way, but the green pasture is this way. The still waters are here. I cried unto the Lord with my voice. He hears my cries for help when my life gets upside down. And he heard me out of his holy hill. Selah, there's a pause there. I laid me down and slept. I wake for the Lord sustained me. See, the problem is when you become your Lord or you become your own shepherd, you're going to run out. There's a time coming. You can't save yourself. I need a shepherd. I will not be afraid of 10,000s of people that have set themselves against me round about. Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God, for thou hast smitten all mine enemies upon the cheekbone. I like how he says it. Thou hast broken the teeth of the ungodly. Look at the picture. It doesn't matter if they're wolves or if they're lions. David talks about the story of pulling a lamb out of a lion. It's all threaded throughout Scripture. How many times have Throwing ourselves into the jaws of worldliness. Jesus, get me out of my mess. Jesus, take the wheel. He says, and he, and, he, and he finishes, salvation belongeth unto the Lord. Thy blessing is upon thy people. Isn't that beautiful? I'm thankful. When my heavenly father steps in, I'm thankful. I remember one time, I wanted, it's just so ridiculous it sounds, but when, when you're young, it's, I wanted to buy something so bad, and, and, and I had a little bit of money saved up. My dad's like, man, don't buy that. Don't buy that. No, I want to get it. I want to get it. And he said, no, and he said, no. And I'm, well, man, I worked for it. It's my money. I want it. Okay. And he gave, and I, and, and it's, it's, man, I'm, like I said, People are stupid, and so am I. He gave me the money. I went out, and I bought the dumb thing. And I'm, within 15 minutes, I was like, man. I went to my dad. I said, I messed up. He looked right at me. Anybody? Anybody concur? I just wish I would have listened. I just wish I would just be. God, help me to be a good listener. Help me to be a. A good, you want to know what makes a good leader? A good listener. You know what makes a good leader? Someone else that knows how to be told. Someone else that knows how to serve. Someone else like, you know what? I need a shepherd. If you don't need a shepherd, you don't need to be a shepherd. That makes sense? He steps in when I'm hopeless. He steps in when I'm helpless. Steps in when I've been vulnerable. He steps in and you know what God does for me? He straightens me out. Can I tell you something? I've been doing this a long time. Now I'm not, there's 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 more time behind me than ahead of me. I may not be the grayest head in or even the baldest head in the church. But I've lived long enough, I can say right now unequivocally, unequivocally, I need God today. I still need shepherding. I still need preaching and teaching. And I still need Jesus with flesh on me. 
ministers and pastors and people yeah. that I know are of the same mindset to look at me. Brother, I love you, but that's not a good idea. Brother, you need to be doing this. Or brother, you need to be doing this. In fact, if you show up a lot of times, I'm sitting there on my knees weeping and crying, listening to a friend of mine preach, knowing I need that. I need God. It's, it's, it's a mind. Some people, oh, I'm not good at this. I'm not good at that. You're good at what you want to be. You have to understand something. You can't come to me and tell me all your struggle with academics. You have to understand when I walked in, Lacey Fitz, you guys listen to When I came into this thing, I had messed my life up so much with illicit drugs and a lifestyle, I couldn't hold the conversation. By the time you finish the sentence, I've already forgot the first part of it, and I could never, I would just look at people like, I oh, didn't have glasses, I'm good. What? That was me. He can fix you. He can take someone without an education and use them. He can take someone that's been broken and help them become a mender. He can take someone that's been down and use them to lift people up. Are you hearing what I'm saying? I want to be sheepish. He steps in and balances me. Anybody have been upside down before? If not, then you're probably down today. If not, then you'll be upside down tomorrow. And that's why we all need the good shepherd. Amen? Because when you feel like you're helpless and you're exposed to predators and you're unable to get to your feet, the good news is he'll protect you. He'll restore you. He'll set you back on your feet and set you on your way. But you got to be on. What's knocked you down? In your own mind, what, what knocks you down? What keeps you from really being led of God? What tips you off balance? You're not even out of whack. You're just off. You're out of balance. What has you exposed to elements and predators? Shepherd can restore you. He can bring you back into the protection of the sheepfold because he protects he corrects, and he connects. You see, a shepherd carries a shepherd's staff. It's a rod. It's a short stick that was cut from a sapling, and the base of the sapling where the, where the roots join is carved away, and he, he manipulates it and creates it to have that uh, kind of a, a thick end, which becomes like a billy club. You know, yeah. Wait a minute. Pastor don't need a billy club. Or you don't need pastor. You don't know. Mm-hmm. He would whittle that thing to fit his hand. Shape it so that he would become effective. You see, a lot of times, shepherds have to spend a lot of time. Pastors, ministers, you got to spend more, so much time on you so that what you become just oozes to help those around. It's just, it's natural. Are you hearing what I'm If you're not submitted to the shepherd, it's hard to ever be one. And the, and the thing is, these shepherds would learn how to throw the staff with speed and accuracy. It would be the main weapon of defense against wild predators. That, you know, they just didn't always run around with guns all the time, okay? We didn't start out with guns. And in fact, Philip, uh, a, a noted author who was an actual shepherd, Philip Keller, he, he wrote, I used to watch the African, he called them lads because of his background, but the African men having competition to see who could throw his rod with the greatest accuracy across great distances. The effectiveness of these clubs in the hands of a skilled shepherd was amazing to watch. The rod was, in fact, an extension of the shepherd's right arm. Isn't that beautiful? It stood as a symbol of strength and power and his authority in any serious situation. Thank God for a pastor, for a shepherd with authority in serious situations are you hearing me the rod is what he relied on to safeguard both himself the flock when there was danger he went on to say furthermore the rod was the instrument he used to discipline and correct any wayward sheep that insisted on wandering away 
he goes on, I could never get over how often with actually the African herders would hurl their rods at a disobedient sheep. If the shepherd saw a sheep wandering way out so her own or approaching poisonous grasses or weeds or areas that were not safe or getting too close to danger of some sort or another, that rod would go whistling through the air and send that wayward animal scattering back to the flock. What is discipline the proof of? Love. If you saw someone you love doing something, you tell them. How many of us sit back and have seen people post those videos of someone getting the thrashing? You know why they can do that? They don't love the person getting the thrashing. You would never see me watching one of you getting the tar beat out of you. I'd never be filming it. I'm either getting the tar beat out of me too or I'm taking care of the predator. You, you can't be a shepherd and be willing to watch someone struggle and go through a battle without trying to help. Now, there's some you can't help, but there ought to be something in your heart. There ought to be something that, that you're, you're in an altar. You're in a burn for prayer because you can't stand to see any sheep suffer at the hands of predators. So discipline is proof of love. Hebrews, and it's a different version, but I want you to listen. It's 12, 5 through 11, and I'm going to hurry here. I'm almost done. Have you completely forgotten this word of encouragement that addresses you as a father, addresses his son? It says, my son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline, and do not lose heart when he rebukes you, because the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastens everyone he accepts as his son. Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as his children. I'm going to be honest with you. Even as a young man, I lost my father at a very, I was a teenager. And I remember getting into church, and, I, and, and hindsight is so amazingly 2020. I look back now, and even today, as I was just kind of reminiscing, realizing the times that, that, that Brother Price was there for me in such a fatherly way, and I didn't realize it. From inviting me over to just work in the greenhouse, from when I would go to him with crazy questions and he would answer or he came down on me a few times. I remember talking about it not two years ago. I went to him before he'd had his first stroke and I said, man, you were hard on me. And he said, oh yeah, I knew what God wanted to do with you. And I knew that if you kept this up, you weren't going to get there. I'm so thankful. I'm thankful because I'm thankful like I got to got to do this. I remember being a young man at an altar, praying with people and working with people. And yeah, there was an inner, inner desire to, to, to want to be anointed and to be used and, and made myself available to the jail ministry and Sunday school and cleaning the bathroom and working the parking lot and, and, and everything. And, and, and what was so amazing is the pastor was working with the staff of the church to gently mold a guy that would one day be here all the other things that have been done because this is not my pastime. Listen, don't expect to be a great shepherd if this is your pastime. This has to be your passion. David couldn't get distracted playing his harp even though he played the harp. He had to know that what he was really there for, there's something about us we have to wake up and be honest. If you really want to be good in the pasture, it's got to be your passion. You can't pick it up Sundays and Wednesdays. It's got to be Monday, Tuesday. It's got to be all nights. You got to try. I know I got problems in my life, but I'm here for the sheep, and I give my life for the sheep. I don't come flying in here while I spend all the time on the other things. I race to try to do a few things that I like to do, but every day it's this. Aren't you glad that we're on his heart and his mind all the time? When he was on the cross, I was on his mind. That he saw me before I was ever born. And he did. That's, we're not a pastime to God. Oh, we're children. We're loved. We have a shepherd, heavenly father. We're, he chases whom he loves, but we know he loves who he shakes. Mm -hmm. 
Can anybody say, you know what, God chasing me today and get me into that place in your sheepfold. Get me to that place, God. Help me to be sheepish. I don't want to be a goat. I want to be a sheep of your pasture. Lead and guide me. I want your green pastures and your still waters. And he goes on, for what, fa- what children are disciplined by their father? In parenthesis in this verse, it says, this trouble you're in isn't punishment. It's training. The normal experience of children. Only irresponsible parents leave children to fend for themselves. If you want an irresponsible God. There's nothing worse than a parent that won't discipline their child. Well, wait a minute. Let me rephrase that. There's nothing worse than a child that's not disciplined by their parent. Yeah, anybody ever been around kids? that get special treatment? Come on. I was raised in a family where we had one that was just always, uh, I was, we had an, I had an old sister, I was the only boy, but we're not the ones who got the rooms by ourselves. He did. Became a problem child. Problem life. We all have problems, but there's a paradigm that gets it. I don't want to be, or I don't want to create people that are problem children. That you're always having to make excuses for them. If you're having to make excuses for people under your leadership, there's a problem. Right? Is this okay? Are you with me? If you're not disciplined and everyone undergoes discipline, then you're not legitimate, not true sons. The Bible in this context actually uses a word that's kind of a bad word today. It's called being your bastards. Moreover, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us and respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the Father of spirits and live? They disciplined us for a little while as they thought best, but God disciplines us for our good in order that we may share in his holiness no discipline seems pleasant at the time but painful later on however it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it remember the psalmist says he leads us to righteousness you can't become righteous without correction and discipline We don't often think of correction as comfort. But it's now comforting to know that he loves us enough to correct us. I remember being a child thinking my dad was the meanest man on the planet. No one could wield a belt like my dad. Man, my little narrow behind could squirm and move and slide and juke and jive and move. But my dad had a way he could plant that belt right across my cheeks, remind me, oh, no. Yeah. But we're not allowed to do that today. Yeah, and look at our world. My dad loved me. (laughs) My dad really loved me. (laughs) He had my best interest. Not only did he spank me, he spent hours lecturing me. I mean, sound like a lecture tonight, but it's really not. Words of love, trying to save us from problems. The word tells us that our heart is evil. And without correction, we would wander into corruption. How many of us have become that child that just can't be told? I want a father that will love me and discipline me. And I want to, I said, that I'd love to hear his voice again. Yes. I'd love to hear his voice again. I'm so thankful that I can hear the voice of God and read his word and feel his unction and feel the rod and feel the staff. And the rod protects us from ourselves, but also from those who would attack. Proverbs 22 and 15 says a foolishness is bound in the heart of a child but the rod of correction shall drive us far from him. Think about that. Foolish, being a child, being young, there's foolishness about you, right? But thank God for correction. It'll drive the foolish. 
when I was a child, I spake as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. Amen. That's Amen. reciprocal here. Hey, to become a shepherd, you got to put away foolish things. Are you hearing what it's? Let, let correction drive the foolishness. Right. Grow up. That's, right. That's how we grow up. Too many of us want the comfort of the staff but refuse the correction of the rod. However, to be sheepish, we must be corrected and protected by the shepherd. The staff is, of course, the long pole with a crook on the end of it. The staff is what brings the sheep to the shepherd. It's used to draw them. Now, there's, there's, there's a reason behind that because when you had lambs and other things that needed guiding more intimately than other sheep, you didn't want the smell of the shepherd on the lamb. So he would use that hook. So not only was he correcting, he was protecting. Isn't that beautiful? The staff brought the sheep together. Yes. Oh, no, little lamb, come back in here with the flock. Oh, no, no, we need you over here. Where you at? Oh, wait, you've been missing a lot of church. The other day, it was kind of funny. Sister Crow said something to someone about, oh, good to see you. And that person got all bent out of shape. Well, they didn't help themselves because guess what? Now we can't turn and say, hey. We love you. Where you been? Because there's something that's happened. You've gone from sheep to wild sheep, and pretty soon you'll be a goat without a shepherd. And probably to the point to where you won't be pastored. Are you hearing me? The staff was also used to guide the sheep. He would take that long staff and place it alongside the sheep to apply pressure. Come on, listen. Y'all felt some pressure from Pastor. I just look at you. What are you doing? Really? <laughs> Our shepherd still does this today. Through his word, through the Holy Spirit, through the body of Christ. Hello? Oh, I need it. Right? I will never forget, I was driving, there was a group of us, we were just young people in the church. I had my little 200 SX, yeah, and I got a car full of people. And when a brand new convert was in us, and he was, you know, he was an amazing guy, still is. And we're driving along, and he's so new, and he's talking, and all of a sudden, this flurry of bad, foul language came out of his mouth, and it all came out, and the car went, Phew, dead silent. You know, because I'm in a car, a bunch of young people in the car, and he's like, it devastated him. You know what I said? Oh, man, that's okay. You're new. It's all right. You know, he didn't need any more. It was just the ghastliness of blowing it in front of everybody. It oh, was enough. You know what he needed then? Picked up. Love. It took, it, man, it took a good 15, 20 minutes and a few Steve Crow jokes to get things back in order. But, you know, I thought he's living for God today. Amen. You never know. When you're called on to, to be there for someone because they've made a mess. Hello? He uses his rod and his staff to correct, protect, connect, and direct us. The psalmist concludes this whole discourse on shepherd by saying he anoints. Who doesn't want to be anointed? Let's stand. I want to wrap this up. Who doesn't want to be anointed by God? Who doesn't want to be, from playing the drums to playing an instrument to taking up the offering to preaching? to te Who doesn't? I mean, if you're, you don't want to be anointed by God, we got deeper problems. You hear a lot about that word anointing around the church, right? Listen, we need to understand that anointing only comes after spending time, a lot of time with and around I, got, I just can't get close to God on a Wednesday night and come running in here, 15 minutes till, and do a few, oh, God's Jesus, 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 and think. Right? Remember, sheep that are closest to the shepherd are the, the anointing is a result of allowing the shepherd to become an instrument. They'll put a bell on the lead sheep and it'll lead them because that one's directly connected to a 
to the shepherd. Anybody ever heard of a Judas horse? When they want it, this is free. When they want to capture wild horses, they'll take a horse that's trained to go to a corral. They'll set up the corral and put that horse in there. And then they'll take that horse out into the wild. They'll find the wild horses. And they'll, they'll turn that Judas horse and start a stampede with all the other horses. And that Judas horse will run to the front and run right into that corral. And all those wild horses will follow that horse into the corral and lead them all to be captured. Get yourself around a sheep close to the shepherd because if you're not careful, a Judas horse will lead you to be captured by the enemy. I want to be anointed, but sadly, too many of us want the oil of anointing without being led, without being fed, without being restored, without being corrected, without being connected. Those things all matter, and I said them quickly, but you need to understand them. How often do we hear and see people ask, I want to be anointed, or I want to be used, but they're not intimately involved. They've said they got their own things they're doing. They're going here. They're going there. They'll make it the service, but the fellowship after, the events after, the things that are going, ah. you got to be connected to the bond of Christ. If I was to take my thumb right here in front of you and cut it off and throw it over there, it's not going to start playing the drums. It's going to it's going to die. It's going to die. The last thing, anointing is life. It's it's movement. It's it's the spirit of God. It's going to die. Why would God anoint you if you're not going to talk with anybody? Why do you need an anointing if you're never going to show real concern over others? I get you care about yours, but a shepherd cares about all. Hello? See, they struggle with seeing the needs of others. They want their, hey, wait a minute, I want my, hold on, I want to see you nurture. I want to see that you really care. They're not concerned or involved in the everyday aspects of the pasture. I've seen a lot of folks running around claiming some kind of anointing that they're really very far from carrying any type of sheepishness. Are you hearing me? Let the shepherd guide, provide, restore, protect, comfort, correct, and connect you. As the result, I can tell you I'm glad and I can say the Lord is mine. Hear that message? The Lord is mine. She's doing a little sheep herding right now. She's training him. You stay by mama. Listen to me. The shepherd is not some figure lurking in the shadows that follows me around. He's a good, good father. One last thing about sheep that I want to finish with and close out. Isaiah 40, 11 says, He shall feed his flock like a shepherd. Isn't that beautiful? He shall gather the lambs with his arm. He carry them in his bosom. And shall gently lead those. I hope that speaks to someone here. Who you win, who you love. Oh, you ought to be so close to the shepherd. Come on. We got a good sheepfold. It's protected. Yes. There is an element of sheep that is brutal and it kind of touches on some of the things I said earlier. Every once in a while, a ewe lamb, a ewe will give birth to a lamb and reject it, whether she's had multiple lambs and can't seem to take care of them or just some, I even read words. There's an in, a, a sense or a feeling in the mother that there's something wrong with the lamb and she'll just reject it. And even if you took the lamb and returned it back to the you or its mother, they'll repeatedly kick it away, avoid it, and ignore it. And pretty soon, what'll happen is that lamb 
will drop its head and become so dejected that it almost looks like it's got a broken neck. I was going to use a picture, but yeah, let your imagination run wild. So they become easy prey, they become victims, and they actually become broken. Hang their heads. They have a word for them. You know what they're called? They're called bummer lambs. Go look it up. But unless the shepherd intervenes in this situation, that lamb's going to die. It's doomed. Rejected and alone. It's, it's not going to make it. So you know what the shepherd does? He takes that rejected little one into his home. He hand feeds it. He keeps it warm by the fire. But he does something else. He takes that rejected little lamb that's been hurt and broken, and he purposely holds it, basically like Sister Crow's holding little Ezekiel right now. He holds him close because he wants that shepherd, that, that lamb, to hear and feel his heart beat. How many... How many of here, when you're lamb stage, you've heard the heartbeat of God? I'm thankful for the times He held me close. It helps me to become who I'm supposed to be every day today. I want to hear the heartbeat of God. Once that lamb is strong enough, Grown up close to the shepherd. The shepherd will return it back into the field with the rest of the flock. And that little lamb, which is now a sheep, never forgets how the shepherd cared for it when it faced rejection. So every time the shepherd shows up and calls for the flock, whatever term that he uses, Guess who's always first? Those lambs that were held closest, the bummer sheep. They know his voice intimately. They love his voice closely. It, 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 it. There's a bond that was created. It wasn't that the bummer lamb was loved more. <clears throat> Listen, it just knows more intimately the one that loves it. Oh. As one bummer lamb to some others, he's a good shepherd. I'm glad that when my family rejected me, when society wouldn't accept me, when I was a mess to myself and doomed to die that there was a shepherd that wrapped his loving arms around me and pulled me close and he took this nothingness and poured his love and his care his chastisement his grooming that that daily chast care and moving oh. he's cared for my every need all these years he's heard every cry know oh, the sound of that heart that loves me you may have been broken before you may have been hurt before you may have been there's a shepherd here today right now that will pull you close and if you'll give him all the pieces he will put you back together again all we like sheep have gone astray. <laughs>